Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Sarasota National Cemetery and Patriot Plaza, where we are celebrating the Stars and Stripes. Isn't this a magnificent facility? I sure hope that you arrived in time to tour some of the artwork and displays that surround us this evening, for they tell the story of commitment, sacrifice, courage, and loyalty that has been and continues to be demonstrated by American service members and their families over the course of our nation's history. I am sure you will have to agree that this is truly a special place and one for which we owe the Patterson Foundation a great deal of thanks. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Retired Tom Piazzi from the Military Officers Association of Sarasota and I'm honored to be serving as your Master of Ceremonies and Commander of Troops for tonight's event. I know that my co-host, Dr. Robin Bell, and the Pops Orchestra of Bradenton in Sarasota join me in extending a hearty welcome to what we hope will be for you both an educational and entertaining experience as we celebrate the 238th birthday of our nation's flag. As most of you know, today, June 14th, is Flag Day, the one day of the year when Americans pay tribute to our nation's flag, one of the best known and most widely respected national emblems in the world. To its citizens and to other persons beyond our borders, our flag is a symbol of America's courage, compassion, and strength. It is also the symbol of the oldest continuing democracy in the world, it represents the stability of our system of government and the noble ideal to which our country was pledged long ago and remains pledged today. The Stars and Stripes first flew in a Flag Day celebration in Hartford, Connecticut in 1861, the first summer of the Civil War. The first national observance of Flag Day came on June 14, 1877, the centennial of the original flag resolution. In the decades that followed, a number of individuals and organizations, such as the Sons of the American Revolution, pressed to have Flag Day observed regularly. A major objective of advocates of Flag Day was to stimulate patriotism among the young. Entreated by patriotic societies, superintendents of schools often used I'm sorry, the superintendent schools were often the first public officials to direct that exercises be conducted. In larger cities, these exercises in schools were viewed as a contribution to the Americanization of immigrant children. But it wasn't until 1916 when President Woodrow Wilson issued a proclamation calling for a nationwide observance of Flag Day on June 14th. 33 years later, Congress gave the holiday permanence by resolving, quote, that the 14th day of June of each year is hereby designated as Flag Day, unquote. President Harry Truman immediately signed the measure into law. But this evening, we are also celebrating the 240th anniversary of the United States Army, an army that has served its nation proudly, faithfully, and successfully over the course of those 240 years. And I can honestly think of no better place to celebrate these two significant achievements than in a place where so many who came before in defense of our way of life are now resting in eternal peace. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that tonight we also commemorate and remember all veterans who served in our armed forces, with emphasis on those who served during the Vietnam War. Fifty years ago, U.S. Marines landed to defend Da Nang, South Vietnam, in support of that threatened country. 
Forty years ago, in spite of a negotiated agreement, North Vietnamese forces caused all remaining U.S. military personnel to be evacuated. By congressional statute and presidential proclamation, a 50th Vietnam War commemoration program has been established. Tonight, you are sharing in that commemoration as we remember those who so proudly served to defend not only the ideals of our great country, but those of a little-known country called South Vietnam. While there were many in our country who did not agree with our presence in that far-off land, the aftermath of the loss of South Vietnam has been well documented. In commemoration of the 50th anniversary of our nation's involvement in what would become known as the Vietnam Conflict, I now ask all veterans who served and their families who also served in support of their deployed loved ones during the Vietnam era to please stand and be recognized. I would now like to ask all other veterans present this evening and their families to also stand and be recognized for their contributions to our country and the freedoms we so enjoy. Thank you all for your service. Please be seated. Much like Flag Day, developing a uniform set of rules for the display, protocol, and respect shown the American flag was a long time process. And it wasn't until 1923 when a conference was held in Washington, D.C. to correct the situation. In June of that year, the American Legion hosted a gathering of representatives from 68 different organizations across the country to accomplish a single mission to produce one definitive set of rules, a code for the proper display, handling, and respect of the United States flag. The end result was what we would become the U.S. Flag Code, which was finally passed into law by Congress in 1942. Tonight's celebration is intended to do two things, honor our nation's flag by providing some long-forgotten history on those events leading up to the birth of Old Glory on June 14, 1777, and to demonstrate the proper handling, protocol, and respect for the stars and stripes as outlined in the U.S. Flag Code. Let's start with our national anthem. As you all know, the Star Spangled Banner is the national anthem of the United States. The lyrics come from defense of Fort McHenry, a poem written in 1814 by a 35-year-old lawyer and amateur poet named Francis Scott Key after witnessing the bombardment of Fort McHenry by British ships of the Royal Navy in the War of 1812. You may also know that the poem was set to a tune of a popular British song of the time that was written by John Stafford Smith for a men's social club in London. What you may not know is that the American flag that flew over Fort McHenry and inspired Francis Scott Key to write his now famous poem measured 30 by 42 feet in size. Each stripe was two feet wide, each star two feet in diameter, and that there were 15 horizontal stripes and 15 stars on the flag, each representing the original 13 colonies and two new states, Vermont and Kentucky, that joined the Union in 1797. Now, to give you some reference as to the size of that flag, it is almost twice the size of the garrison flag flying over the cemetery this evening. It is interesting to note that the Star Spangled Banner was first recognized for official use by the Navy in 1889 and by President Wilson in 1916 but it wasn't made the national anthem by Congre congressional resolution until March 3rd, 1931, 117 years after it was written. How about that for some speedy legislation? <laughs> the 
The flag code stipulates that during a rendition of the national anthem and when the flag is displayed, individuals in uniform should give the military salute at the first note of the anthem and maintain that position until the last note. Members of the armed forces and veterans who are present but not in uniform may render the military salute in the manner provided for individuals in uniform. All other persons should face the flag and stand at attention with their right hand over their heart. And men not in uniform, if applicable, should remove their headdress with their right hand and hold it on their left shoulder, the hand being over their heart. When the flag is not displayed, all present should face toward the music and act in the same manner as they would if the flag were displayed. Let's give it a try. Color guard, sent her heart. Ladies and gentlemen, please join Ms. Robin Fernandez in the singing of our national anthem. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in our second round of applause for both Miss Robin Fernandez and the San Sons of the American Color Guard, commanded by Mr. Victor McMurray. Vane Scott III, our featured performer this evening, hails from Newcomerstown, Ohio where he was born, raised, and educated. He is a Navy veteran who achieved the grade of E-5 while serving aboard two destroyers before leaving the service to pursue a career in management with the Annan Flag Company. Vane learned about the American flag from his father, who created and performed the show you are about to see all over the country for more than 30 years. The last six of those years, Vane traveled with his dad as his roadie driving and helping to sell his videos. 
As a result of this experience, Vane got to know the show pretty well, and he eventually decided to continue his father's work when his dad passed away in 2011. Just so you know that Vane is more than just a businessman and traveling performer, I thought it important to mention that he is currently the commander of his local honor guard and the president of his local honor, historical society. With all that said, I welcome and present to you Vane Scott III and his rendition of The Many Faces of Old Glory. Greetings. While we enjoy this wonderful overture by Eric Benjamin of the Tuscarawa Philharmonic of Ohio, tonight performed by the Pops Orchestra, your community orchestra for Bradenton and Sarasota, and conducted by Robin Bell. I'm going to take you back in our history and allow our country's founders and key individuals to speak to you once again to remind everyone on how our country was founded and how our flag came to be. You might think it's going to not going to be or it's going to be boring, but it's not. You may think it's unimportant, but it is. You may think it does not concern you, but it does. You may say you don't in the oldest country anything, but you do. Think about that again after you've seen this show. Listen to these words from the past and know without them you might not be here today. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Hear more voices from the past. Taxation without representation is tyranny. James Otis, 1770. Give me liberty or give me death. Patrick Henry, 1775. If they want to have a war, let it begin here. Captain John Parker at the Battle of Lexington, April 19, 1775. Don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. Israel Putnam at Bunker Hill. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thomas Jefferson, July 4th, 1776. I only regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. Nathan Hale. These are the times that try men's souls. Thomas Paine. I have not yet begun to fight. John Paul Jones. Where liberty dwells, there is my country. Benjamin Franklin. Eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. John Curran. To be prepared for war is one of the most effectual means of preserving peace. George Washington. Don't give up the ship. Captain James Lawrence. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light. Francis Scott Key. We have given them a near perfect republic but will they keep it or will they, in the enjoyment of the material abundance we have given them, lose the memory of freedom? Thomas Jefferson. This nation will remain the land of the free only so long as it is the home of the brave. Elmer Davis, American journalist. Our great modern republic. May those who seek the blessings of its institution and the protection of its flag Remember the obligations they impose. Ulysses S. Grant.
I am an American. Have you ever looked into the eyes of an immigrant that has just become a new United States citizen? One who took the long and difficult journey from poverty and hopelessness, pledged their loyalty and allegiance to our flag, and are ready to start a new life. You can see the hope, the dreams, the eagerness that lies within. Now they can have a real life, one that means a future for their children that was never there for them. Now they too can proudly say, I am an American. We hope after you've seen this show and you leave this place, you will tell your children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren how important it is for them to understand why we all love this country so much. After all, they are the future of America, and they must have the same eagerness to join the American dream, or through ignorance, indifference, or their own prosperity, lose it all. Ladies and gentlemen, and children of all ages, the Military Association of Sarasota and the Pops Orchestra is proud to present Vane Scott III and the many faces of old glory. Well, good evening, everybody. And I'd like to welcome you here on Flag Day to learn about our flag. But before I tell you the story of how we got our flag and how we got the United States, I want to tell you a story of how another country got their flag, one you'll be familiar with. The oldest known flag that is still being used today began way back in the year 1200 when the English Knights were returning home from the Crusades and well, they were passing through the city of Genoa, Italy, and they saw pieces of cloth waving on poles all over the city. And, well, they liked what they saw, but what they saw was called a flag. The flag was called the Cross of St. George. Just a simple red cross on a white flag. Now, there are a lot of other countries in the world that still use this design, like Norway, Denmark, Sweden and Finland, only in different color combinations. Well, the English liked this idea so well, they took it home with them and adopted it as the official flag of England. Well, 400 years later, there's a queen on the throne of England, Queen Elizabeth I. Well, this is still her flag, but she's fighting a different war now. She's fighting Scotland. It's one of the worst wars in history. Well, her troops are under the cross of St. George, but the Scots, well, they're fighting for a king, King James of Scotland. Well, he's got a cross, but his is a little different. His is called the Cross of St. Andrew. Now, this is still a popular flag today, so if you see somebody flying this in their front yard, well, you'll know they're pretty proud of their Scottish ancestry. So here we have the two great armies of the world fighting this terrible war under the two crosses. Well, Queen Elizabeth I is so busy being one of the best queens England ever had, she never had time for romance. She could never find the right guy. And in 1603, Queen Elizabeth died and left no heirs to the throne of England. She's the last of the royal blood. But where are they going to find a relative to sit on the throne? I mean, there's none left in England. <laughs> well, they search all around and they find a distant cousin. But who is it? <laughs> it's King George of Scotland, but he's the enemy. Well, they have to ask him anyway, will you be our king? Well, James is thinking, you know, if I'm the king over both countries, that will end the war. So in 1603, he ascended the throne of England as James the first. <laughs> but the fighting didn't stop because now they're gonna fight over which flag to fly. I mean, the English, they wanna keep the cross of St. George. It's been their flag for 400 years, but the Scots are fighting saying, hey, that's our king on the throne. We wanna fly our flag. So before this gets into another war, 
James better do something in a hurry. And he did. You see, he figured out a way to make everybody happy. All he did was stick toast both crosses onto one flag. Now this is called the king's colors in your history books. This flag came to North America. We named our first permanent settlement after this king, Jamestown. Came back again on the Mayflower in 1620, the king's colors. Well, about a hundred years later, there's another queen on the throne, Queen Anne. <laughs> well, she don't want to fly the king's colors, right? Because she's the queen. So she redesigned the flag of England and stuck those king's colors up in the corner of her red ensign. Now this is called the Queen Anne or the British red ensign. Some of the more adventuresome folk called it the red meteor. Now this is the flag England flew when she colonized the world. It will come to North America. George Washington will fight against this in our revolution. And it will play a very important role in the development of the flag of the United States. So remember it, because I'm going to show it to you again later. The Queen Anne, or the British Red Ensign. Well, to finish up this story, about a hundred years later, England took in Ireland and became the United Kingdom. England, Scotland, and Ireland. Well, Ireland, they've got a skinny red cross. They call the cross of St. Patrick. Of course, somebody says, well, stick that on the flag with the other two crosses. So in 1801, the flag of the United Kingdom was born. All three crosses onto one flag. See that skinny red cross? Well, that's Ireland, the cross of St. Patrick. Now, this is still the flag of the United Kingdom today and is known around the world as the British Union Jack. Well, as you can tell from that story, if you're going to design your country's flag, well, you just don't sit down and draw one, right? I mean, that one took 600 years. But what about our flag? Well, there are many versions of how we got our flag and how we got the United States. I call mine the many faces of old glory. And, well, you're sure going to know why when we get to the end. The people you're going to hear about and the incredible things they did is all based on truth. For they not only gave us our flag, they gave us our country. Because you can't tell the story of how we got our flag without telling how we got the United States. Now, now don't worry, folks. This isn't a history lecture tonight. There's some humor in some of these stories, and man, I sure hope you're going to laugh when it's funny. But I know you'll be thrilled when it's thrilling. And there are some sad places, too. And now, the story. A moth-eaten rag on a worm-eaten pole does not seem likely to stir a man's soul. Tis the deeds that were done neath that moth-eaten rag when the pole was a staff and the rag was a flag. The year is 1770. We have 13 colonies on the East Coast. We're occupied by King George's army. Well, we're not allowed to own military ships or military weapons. <laughs> we can't even train military units. We're under the thumb of the king. Well, the king figures out that it's costing him a fortune to keep his army of occupation here. So he had what was called the Stamp Act passed over in Parliament in England where we had no vote. A heavy tax on the colonies. Boy, did we get mad about that. Taxation without representation is tyranny, we said. The colonists were so mad, they rioted against the troops in Boston. Five citizens were slain by the British soldiers. 
in what history now calls the Boston Massacre. There's a monument down at the old square in Boston that has the names of those very first Americans that died for the cause of freedom. And we can't recite any of their names, but I'll tell you the name of the first man that's on the list. His name is Crispus Attucks, a black man. Honor to Crispus Attucks, one of the very first Americans to die for the cause of freedom. Now, it's 1775. We're still under the thumb of the king. But the rest of the world, well, they find out about this rich new continent. They're sending ships, we're trading, we're making lots of money. But boy, the heavy tax on the colony's tea is really boiling now. There's again calls for taxation without representation as tyranny. We want to vote on our own tax money. We want to spend it here on roads and bridges and schools and maybe some new voting machines here in Florida. <laughs> well, the king ignored us, so we got madder. Now we're forming secret societies and clubs and organizations. We're stealing guns and ammunition. There's talk of a rebellion against the king. Somebody says we're secretly training an army in the woods. Well, now these groups are starting to get names like the Minutemen, the Militia, the Sons of Liberty, the Oak Ridge Boys. Ah, I'm just seeing if you're paying attention. Well, you don't want to join the Sons of Liberty. You know those guys, those guys want a revolution. You see, in this point in our history, well, we didn't want a revolution. We thought we were English, part of Mother England and proud of it. But boy, are we mad at the king over the tax. And now, it's April 18th, 1775, and a Boston silversmith learns that the British troops under General Gage are going to march in Charleston and Boston to Lexington. They're going to arrest two of our greatest patriots for treason. Then they're going to go on to Concord and confiscate the guns and ammunition they found out we've got hidden there. They're going to squash the rebellion. Well, Paul Revere's about to ride into history. He and his friend, Mr. Dawes, mount up. Paul Revere stopped at the old North Church along the way when he found out the direction and the route that the British troops were going to take. And he had a signal lantern hung up way up in the belfry so the other riders would know. And they began their ride. Well, they're pounding on every farmhouse, villages, and hamlet door along the way. The regulars are marching. The regulars are marching. The British are coming. Well, when they got to Lexington, 14 miles away, they pounded on the door of Captain John Parker. He's the head of the local Minutemen there, you know. And they said something like, John, John, they're coming to arrest Samuel Adams and John Hancock for treason. And they're going to take our guns and they rode off into the night. Well, Captain Parker, well, he knew what to do. His men are mad, they're ready to fight, so he sounds the alarm. 170 men answer the call. They're running out of the farms and villages and hamlets, carrying squirrel guns and pitchforks and clubs and waving the craziest looking flag you ever saw. Well, they gathered on the green near the bridge. Boy, we're waving that flag. We're going to fight the army. <laughs> well, when they looked across the bridge, there wasn't anybody there. They had got there too quick. The army was hours away. Well, Captain Parker saw his men cooling down, and he says, you know, you men might as well as just go on home because they're not going to be here for a while. But when they get closer, I'll call you back. Well, that's what they did. Everyone went home, but man, now, now they've got a chance to think about this dumb thing they're about to do. I mean, can you imagine going up against the king's army with a squirrel gun? These guys aren't soldiers. They're farmers and hunters and merchants, and they're going to fight a war. And it's not in a foreign land. It's going to be right in their own front yard. 
Well, pretty soon, it's after midnight. No one could sleep, you know. These men are tossing and turning and holding their breath to every fast horse in the night to see if that's going to be the alarm. Well, finally, at 4.30 a.m. on April 19, 1775, Captain Parker sounds the alarm again. The men are back. The man with the flag is back. We're ready to fight the army. Well, this time, they were there. The British commander looked across the bridge and saw all these mean-looking guys with their squirrel guns and pitchforks. And he says, lay down those arms and step aside. <laughs> Captain Parker says, no, stand your ground. Fire, if only a fire to pawn. But if they want to have a war, let it begin here. <laughs> that didn't scare the commander. He says, lay down those arms in the name of the king. Well, Captain Parker, he looked at his men the second time. They're trembling with fear. They're ill-equipped and ill-trained. And he looked across the bridge at the best equipped, best trained army in the world. Well, what's he going to do? Well, he's got to get them out of there, right? Run, retreat, retreat, take your guns with you. We'll fight another day. Everyone's running around trying to get out of the way. By the rude bridge that arched the flood, their flag to April's breeze unfurled. And here once the embattled farmer stood and fired the shot heard round the world. The revolution has begun. This is called the Bedford flag because the man that carried it that day well, he ran all the way from the little town of Bedford down the road just to get into the fight. His name was Nathaniel Page, and they traced this flag back through his family's history almost 100 years before this. It's in a museum today and is considered to be one of the oldest flags in North America. The Latin on this flag means conquer or die. Some of us died that day. You know, but we beat them. You know, we beat the king's army there because, you know, we didn't fight like they did. You know, back in these days, the great armies of the world, man, were those guys dumb. You know, they would stand in close, tight ranks and just shoot point blank at each other like ducks in a shooting gallery. <laughs> they were crazy. We couldn't fight that way. We didn't have enough guns. And besides that, I'm hoping maybe we were a little smarter than that. We fought them Indian style. We hid behind the trees and behind the rocks and in the ditches and in the houses. And we picked them off all the way back to Boston. Their losses were terrible. Well, many years later, a letter was found that was written home by one of those British officers that was in that terrible march. And he wrote it the very next day while it was all still fresh in his mind. And in his letter, he paid tribute to our colonial minute man when he wrote, well, whoever looks upon them as an irregular mob will find himself very much mistaken nor are they void of a spirit of enthusiasm as we experienced yesterday. For many of them concealed themselves in houses to advance to within 10 yards to fire at me and other officers, though they were morally certain of being put to death themselves in an instant. Well, we beat the king once. If we had a leader, could we beat him again? Well, who are we going to get for a leader? Well, the best known military man at the time is George Washington. So we asked him, will you lead our army against the king? We want to vote. Well, Washington, well, well, he's for the cause, all right. But he knows there's no army out there. 
There's just a bunch of guys running around in the woods with squirrel guns and pitchforks. But he says, you know, I've made my fortune in America. I'll put up my very own money to train and outfit the first thousand men. And when they're ready to fight, I'll take command. Well, that's what he did. But where is he going to get all these cannons and all these guns that it takes to fight a revolution? No one can get in to help us, you know. The British have the biggest navy in the world. The whole East Coast is blockaded. But Washington, well, Washington, he knows a secret. He knows the British, well, they have lots of cannons and guns. But they're stored down in the Bahama Islands in the caves off the East Coast. And, well, they know we can't go there because we're not allowed to own ships, right? So Washington's thinking, I just need to borrow two ships from Carnival Cruise Lines. <laughs> well, you know he's not going to do that, right? I mean, they would break down halfway there. There'd be no running water, the toilets overflowing, people hanging sheets off the side of the ship. <laughs> It'd be a mess. <laughs> but where's he going to get enough money to build six ships secretly? Well. He remembered something very important. He had went and married one of the richest women in North America. Nah, he married her before he needed the money. But I've seen her picture, and man, she'd better have a lot of money, buddy. <laughs> I'm sorry, Martha. So he asked her, will you help me? I need enough money to build six ships secretly. Well, you know she's going to help her husband. So evidently, she just gave him her American Express car. Well, pretty soon he got those ships built. He's got to find sailors to sail them, and he finds them too. He's got to have a landing party, right? Someone has to go ashore and do the dirty work when they get there, and he finds them too. Well, pretty soon they're ready to go, and all six of those ships are secretly sailing down the inland waterway, and all six of those ships are flying the pine tree flag. Well, that's a good name for this flag, right? But they called those ships Washington's cruisers. Heck, I'd have think I'd have called them Martha's cruisers, wouldn't you? I mean, she paid for them, didn't she? The landing party. Well, that's Colonel Christopher Gadsden's men. Well, they want to fly his flag from those ships, too. His flag looks like this. The Gadsden flag. Well, this gets, <laughs> this gets the attention of the Tea Party crowd now, but it also gets the attention of the IRS. So you got to be careful flying this one. Well, these men got there safely, went ashore, did it in the British guards, and took all those cannons and guns and brought them back to start our rebellion. But who were these guys? Colonel Christopher Gadsden's men. We'll follow them up through history just a couple more years. They become the United States Marines. So the next time you hear from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, remember, it all began on the beaches of the Bahamas under a rattlesnake flag. Well, now it's January 1776, and Washington is ready. He mounts up and joins the Philadelphia Light Horse Troop. They're going to escort him to Cambridge, Massachusetts, where he's going to take command of the Continental Army of the Colonies. The Philadelphia Light Horse Troop flag is still in the museum in Philadelphia. It's a gold silk flag with 13 blue and silver stripes painted over top of the king's colors that were in the corner. Maybe this is an omen of something to come. Well, these men, they got Washington safely to Cambridge. And when he arrived, there was a thousand men waiting on their new commander to take command. And flying over their head was a flag no one had ever seen before. She's in your history books. It's called the Grand Union Flag. But where did this idea come from? 
Well, as I told you earlier than this, in this point in our history, we thought we were English, part of Mother England and proud of it. But boy, are we mad at the king over the tax. And to show the king just how mad we are, someone had the nerve to take one of the king's flags, the British Red Ensign. Remember, I showed this one to you earlier. They had the nerve to take one of the king's flags and so six white strips of cloth to show that the colonies were united in the stripes but separate from the king's colors in the corner. And we went to war under the Grand Union flag. Well, we won a few battles, lost a whole lot more. The first thing you know, summer's coming on. More people are joining the Sons of Liberty now. There's calls for freedom and independence. And on the 4th of July, 1776, we declared our independence. Now we're a new nation. But boy, we have to win this war. Would you believe if we hadn't have won, all of our heroes and patriots could have been jailed or executed for treason. So nobody wanted to fly this flag anymore. So we fought on for almost a year without a flag. Then in 1777, Congress decided, you know, here we are. We're a new nation. We're putting ships to sea. We're trading. We're fighting a war. We have to have identification. We've got to have a flag. So on June 14th, of course, that's the day we still celebrate as Flag Day, Congress passed the first flag resolution, just a simple paragraph. And all it said was, resolved the flag of the United States shall be 13 alternate red and white stripes and 13 white stars in a blue field representing a new constellation. Well, that's all they said. No artwork, no drawings, no samples, just words. And in 1777, well, there were no flag factories. All these flags are made by individual seamstresses. Every village, every hamlet, every army unit, every ship had their own seamstress. And the words went out describing the new flag. Make the new flag of the United States of America. <laughs> uh, there were no two flags alike. That's where I got the title, The Many Faces of Old Glory, and here they come. One of the first examples takes place in the little town we call Bennington, Vermont today. But back in these days, it was still Bennington, New York. And the colonel of the Bennington militia, Colonel John Stark, is about to go to war against the king when his wife says, well, John, if you're going to fight for your country, you've got to have your country's flag. So she's going to make her husband's flag. The one she made's in the history books. It's called the Bennington flag, named after her husband's Bennington militia. But where did she get the idea to put white stripes on the outside? Or for that matter, she has seven points on the stars. Well, the historians say that about the only thing anybody could find in print about flag designs were in the rules of heraldry over in Europe and England that said something like alternating colors of stripes should begin and end with white. Stars, well, they had to have six or more points to even be a star. Anything with five back in these days, well, they didn't call them stars. They called them rowels or spurs, and Congress had said star. So to her, that meant six or more. And as you can see, she figured her husband was worth at least a seven, maybe. Well, he ran his wife's flag up the pole. He gathered his men around. And in a quote from the history books, Colonel Stark says, Men, we're going up against the king's army, and we're either going to win, or my wife will be a widow. Man, I'm sure glad I wasn't in this guy's outfit because all of a sudden, 
the battle began. And right away, he could see he wasn't going to win the Battle of Bennington. No, the British general, General Burgoyne, he was going to win. But suddenly, over in the hills, he could hear cannons roaring, guns crackling, men are shouting, there's somebody coming to the rescue. But they're so far away, he can't see them. So he tells the sergeant to get out the long glass. The sergeant gets out the long glass. And he says, who's coming to the rescue, sergeant? Well, I'll tell you one thing, Pilgrim. That's not Hillary Clinton. <laughs> but they've got a strange flag like I've never seen before. Colonel Stark said, a strange flag like he's never seen before? Well, could it have been the Cape Crusader? Oh, <laughs> uh, I don't think it was him. I don't even think he was born yet, was he? Then someone shouted, hey, they've got a green flag with 13 rowels on it. Well, Colonel Stark says a green flag, well, that's got to be Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys. They're coming to the rescue, and come they did. Ethan Allen had captured Fort Ticonderoga from the British at Lake Champlain, dragged those cannons across the mountains, and saved Colonel Stark at the Battle of Bennington, flying their green flag. Well, this isn't such a bad idea, you know. These guys are fighting in the woods. They're hiding in the grass, crawling around in the weeds. And, well, you don't want to go around dragging a red and white striped flag doing that, right? Five points on the stars. One of the very first flags in our history books with five. Nobody knows who made it. One of these woodsy guys, well, he didn't know anything about heraldry rules, but boy, could they fight. They'd already been through the Battle of Bunker Hill. But unfortunately, Ethan Allen was captured later by the British and spent the rest of the revolution in jail over in England. But when it, the war was over, they let him out, and he came back home to the land of opportunity. And I, is he the guy that started that furniture factory? But what happened to Colonel Stark? You know, his wife didn't become a widow that day or the next. In fact, he became a general and outlived them all. He was the oldest surviving general of the revolution. And Congress gave him a gift, a section of land. But it was in a place so awful, so terrible, they just gave it away. Where is this awful, terrible place? Ohio, <laughs> where I'm from. <laughs> we call his section of land Stark County now. So the next time, if you're ever up at Canton at the Pro Football Hall of Fame, well, that's Stark County. And they remembered his wife that made his flag for him too. In fact, they named a hospital after her. She's in your history books, Molly Stark. Well, if that's not Paul Harvey and the rest of the story, well, I don't know what is. You know, history is exciting when you hear about these guys. Well, a little while ago, we beat General Burgoyne at the Battle of Bennington, but he got away from us. Then he ran right into the Battle of Saratoga, and we beat him there too. In fact, we captured him. And when the French found out that we had captured this great general. They said, you know, maybe these crazy Americans can win their revolution. So let's give them some help. So among other things, they gave us some ships. We put cannons on them, found volunteer sailors, and put a man in charge, John Paul Jones. Well, John Paul Jones is getting these ships outfitted. Meanwhile, he ordered a flag made of the United States by a local seamstress. He decided to name his flagship the Bon Homme Richard to honor an old friend of his, Benjamin Franklin, who had published Poor Richard's Almanac. Well, pretty soon he got those ships ready. He run that flag up in the riggings and proudly set sail as the United States Navy under a flag known in the history books 
as the Bon Homme Richard flag. But it only has 12 stars. Well, I thought we had 13 states. Well, the historians tell us that communications are so bad back in these days because, well, Al Gore hadn't invented the internet yet. Communications were so bad, John Paul Jones could not find out whether Georgia had joined the revolution yet or not. So he went to sea under a 12-star flag. I told this same story to a gentleman from Georgia just a couple weeks ago. He said, I don't think they've joined yet. Well, here he is at sea, looking for a British fighting force, a squadron of warships, and he finds them off the east coast of Scotland in the North Sea at a place called Firth of Forth. Well, they're moving in on each other. They're getting closer and closer. They're sizing each other up. And all of a sudden, the British sailors fire a cannon shot. It hits the Bonhomme Richard right at the water line. Boy, she's taking on water now. But that started the sea battle. And this battle lasted for over six hours. Well, John Paul Jones has got to do something right. The ship is sinking right out from under him. He looked over at the British warship. He shot their mast away. They're stopped dead in the water. And their sailors, while they're so tired from the fight, they're not going to last much longer. Now, you're not going to believe what happened next, but up comes Brian Williams from NBC. What? He's in all the wars, isn't he? So Brian asked him, he says, John Paul, what do you think you're going to do now? Well, John Paul Jones looked at him and he uttered his famous words, I have not yet begun to fight. And with those words, he ordered every car yard of canvas. He could get up in the riggings and he sailed that sinking ship as fast as she'd go right into the side of the British warship. They swung aboard, tied up the crew and captured the ship. But he had to cut the bond home Richard loose. She's going down fast. And he watched his ship float away and sink to the bottom of the ocean. And his colors went with her. Now here he is, stopped dead in the water on a captured British ship with no flag. Well, he's got to get out of there, right? So he jerry-rigged the mast back up. He got enough canvas into the air, and he sails into the nearby neutral Dutch port of Texel. And they drop anchor. Well, they're frantically working on this shot-up British warship, trying to get her seaworthy again. And John Paul Jones orders a boat lowered. They rowed him into port, probably looked up the harbor master, and maybe it went something like this. Sir, my name is John Paul Jones of the United States Navy. We've got this captured British warship in the harbor here, trying to get her seaworthy again. We want to go home, but we lost our flag. You see, back in these days, you couldn't sail without a flag, or they figured you were a pirate. So he asked this Dutchman, does anyone here know what my new country's flag looks like? <laughs> well, would you believe that Dutchman had a drawing of the flag of the United States? Where in the world did this drawing come from? Well, historians tell us that earlier than this, our ambassador to France, who happened to be Benjamin Franklin, was in the French parliament one day, and maybe it went something like this. Monsieur, you are a new country in the world. You're putting ships to sea. You're trading. You're fighting a war. Could you describe your country's new flag? Susie Cordart is here. We make the sketches, send them to the nearby ports. Then we can recognize your ships at sea. Well, Ben thinks, well, that's a pretty darn good idea. So he remembered back to the day they passed the first flag resolution. Remember, I recited it to you earlier, describes the flag in detail. So he tells the court artist all about it. 
They make those drawings. They send them around to the nearby ports. John Paul Jones got one of those flags in the port of Texel, had a local seamstress make the flag, took it back to the captured warship, run it up in the riggings, and proudly set sail for home under what he thought was the official flag of the United States, according to Benjamin Franklin. Small problem though, you see. Historians think that old Ben, well, he was asleep the day they passed the resolution. Uh, I tell the school kids, see what happens if you don't pay attention in class. <laughs> this is called the Texel flag, named after that Dutch port where it was made. The most amazing part of this story is John Paul Jones got home safe under this flag. Well, I'm surprised the British, the Americans, the Huguenots, and everybody else wasn't shooting at this, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> now he's a hero. So they're gonna build him a new flagship called the Alliance. Well, when the ship's almost ready, when the ladies of Portsmouth, where they're building the ship, well, they're going to make him the official flag because, well, they sure don't want him to go to sea with this. The one they made is named after his flagship. This is called the Alliance flag. Well, here we have the heraldry rules again. We got white stripes on the outside. We're up to eight points on the stars now. You know the rules. Six or more points. One flag, one ship one group of seamstresses. There were no two flags alike. Down south, one of the worst battles of the entire revolution takes place in a little town. You could go through your whole life and never hear of it. Unfortunately, we lost that battle. But while we were losing it, we beat up Cornwallis's British army so bad, they never recovered. And by the time they got to the Battle of Yorktown, there just wasn't enough fight left. And Cornwallis surrendered the British army. And the revolution was over. The beginning of the end of the British army began in the little town of Guilford Courthouse, North Carolina. And those good old boys well, they fought for liberty under their stars and stripes too, but small problem. Historians think they heard that resolution with different ears than we did. <laughs> oh, the Guilford Courthouse flag. What a flag, huh? The original Guilford Courthouse flag hangs in the museum in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, and is considered to be a relic of one of the worst flags of the entire... <laughs> I'm sorry, a relic of the worst battle of the entire revolution. <laughs> Easton, Pennsylvania. We hit the Liberty Bell there on its way to Allentown so the British wouldn't find it. Well, the ladies of Easton says, well, we'll make your flag, but what are they gonna make? Well, remember the resolution, 13 alternate red and white stripes, 13 white stars in a blue field. What is so complicated about all this? What would you make if you had never seen one? Well, the ladies of Easton says, well, they don't think it's so complicated. They say they know exactly what Congress meant. You know, just like we do today, right? So the ladies of Easton said, well, according to Congress, this is the official flag of the United States. Well, now wait a minute, let's go over it again. 13 alternate red and white stripes. There they are, they didn't say where. 13 white stars in a blue field, there they are, big as life. Technically you could say this is as correct as the one we fly today. The original Eastern flag hangs in a museum and they still argue, was it in our rebellion or the War of 1812. Well, 
about this time, George Washington, well, he hears about all this. You know, here we are, a new nation. We're putting ships to sea, we're trading, we're fighting a war. We're trying to get a little respect in the world. And we can't even make two flags that look alike. So he and a couple congressmen are gonna to get together and get the first official flag made right because, well, because none of these are. Well, here's where the historians reach that fork in the road. Who made it? Well, a lot of them want to give the honor to a congressman from New Jersey, Francis Hopkinson, because to this day, they still have the bill that he turned in for the design of the great seal of the United States and one flag. But unfortunately for Mr. Hopkinson, his flag didn't survive or any drawings or descriptions. And besides that, there's no proof that he was ever paid. So that leads the other historians. Well, they want to give this great honor to a professional flag maker from Philadelphia, Betsy Ross. Well, she was paid. They've got her paid receipts for federal flags for the government. But unfortunately, none of her flags or drawings or descriptions survived either. So we can't prove for sure who made that first official flag. But the legend of Betsy Ross lives on. Now imagine the President of the United States and those two congressmen in her tiny living room. Well, they're discussing all these flags you've seen. Well, the men, well, they don't like the ones with heraldry rules with the white stripes on the outside because they say on a bright, sunshiny day, well, those white stripes, they blend in with the bright sky in the background. Looks like there's only 11 stripes. The flags look smaller. So they decided just to ignore the rules and put red stripes on the outside. Then, according to the legend, Betsy Ross says, well, gentlemen, if you're gonna do something about the stripes, could I do something about these stars? What's wrong with the stars, they said. She said, well, the ladies that are making them, they're using six, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 points. They're all different shapes and sizes. They're crooked and they're hard to make. But gentlemen, with your permission, I would like to use a five-pointed star because I can cut a perfect one with one cut of the scissors. Well, of course, that means she can make the flags faster. Everyone knows that if you work for the federal government, you have to be efficient, right? You know, my dad told that same story to a group of retirees from the Pentagon. <laughs> yeah, they didn't even snicker at that one. <laughs> but can you imagine how nervous Betsy Ross is with the President of the United States in her living room? You know, if you went home tonight and you found a strange guy in your living room in tight robin egg blue satin pantaloons, and a cape, powdered wig, buckles on their shoes, a silk shirt, and a linen handkerchief. You would swear this was Elton John, wouldn't you? <laughs> well, she's gonna make one cut, and I sure hope I did this right, because I only brought one piece of paper. I don't hear anybody breathing. Well, let's see how we did here. Well, gee whiz, look at that. You ought to applaud for that, right? So, according to the legend of Betsy Ross, that's how we got this first official flag, but there's, there's something wrong already. You see, there's more than one version. Now, this is called the Betsy Ross flag, the one we all know and love and grew up with those 13 white stars in a circle on the blue field. But the historians tell us that most of these early flags, those 13 white stars were in straight staggered lines, just like they are today. But this one is official and it should be treated as such. The first one, the Betsy Raw.
Well, we won that war, in case you missed history class that day. And now it's 1780, and the governor of Massachusetts awards the Black Massachusetts Company their flag. Their flag was called the Bucks of America. They were the freed black slaves that fought violently in the revolution. They gained the attention of the governor and the president. These guys were heroes in every sense of the word and way too little attention is given to them in our history books for fighting on the side of freedom. Well, the king says, you didn't win anything. He's stopping our ships at sea. He's kidnapping our sailors and we're getting madder by the moment. But we took in two more states. Now we're up to 15. <laughs> our flag's wrong already. So Congress passed another resolution. Pretty much the same as the first. They just changed the numbers. 15 stars, 15 stripes. Then we got into the War of 1812 with King George again, and we fought it under that second flag resolution. And this is what it looked like when Francis Scott Key looked out the porthole with the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, and wrote our national anthem. That's why we call this the Star Spangled Banner flag. And the reason he could see it at night, well, it was flying over Fort McHenry and was the largest battle flag ever flown, 30 by 42 feet. The original Star Spangled Banner flag hangs in the Smithsonian today, totally restored. So your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and these kids' great-grandchildren can go see this jewel of America. Well, we won that war too, but we took in five more states while we were fighting it. Now we're up to 20. What's Congress gonna do? Are they gonna keep doing the same thing? 20 stars, 20 stripes. You know, if they'd have kept that up, our 50 star flag that we fly today would have 50 stripes in a lapel pin? Well, they knew they were in trouble. So in 1818, Congress passed the third flag resolution. Resolved, the flag of the United States shall be 13 alternate red and white stripes to honor the original 13 colonies and one star for every state thereafter. That's how we got back to 13 stripes. The Star Spangled Banner flag is the only official flag that didn't have 13 stripes. But what did that 20 star flag look like in 1818? Well, a lot of them looked like this. The great star flag, obviously. But there were others. And as we came up through the years and we added more states and more stars to the blue field, there were other great star designs. But this was the first one, the 20 star. There have been 27 official flags of the United States, beginning with Betsy Ross, right on up through these, to the 50-star flag we fly today, which became official on the 4th of July, 1960. The stories you have heard tonight have invested our flag with much historical meaning, but it's up to each person of every generation to understand and appropriate the meaning of the flag for themselves. President Woodrow Wilson once wrote, this flag which we honor 
and under which we serve is the emblem of our power, our thought, and purpose as a nation. It has no other character than that which we give it from generation to generation. The choices are ours. When our great banner of freedom was first raised, hopes and dreams were high for a perfect union. Our forefathers fought and died for the principles of the Bill of Rights. They believed those benefits would come to all future generations of Americans. The flag they raised that day, it was pure and proud with no past, only a future to be built on those same foundations. The soft breezes of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that caressed their flag that April's day, well, it still exists. But unfortunately, not for all Americans. Oh, you may be born an American, which is one thing, but to be an American, well, that's quite another. We must continue to build on these same foundations, not only as a nation, but as individuals working together to create that perfect union with liberty and justice for all. Isn't it great to be an American? Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It has been my honor to be with you this evening. You know, I would be remiss this evening if I didn't say a couple thank yous. First of all, I would like to thank my host, Barbara Hamilton, for allowing my wife and I to invade her lovely home. I would also like to thank, of course, Patriot Plaza. This is a gorgeous place. I've never seen anything like this. And Robin Bell and the Pops Orchestra. And I would also a special thanks to the people that invited me here, Tom Piazzi and the Military Office Association of Sarasota. But mostly, I would like to thank you, the citizens of Sarasota and Bradenton. You have opened your arms and welcomed me and my wife here like we're part of this community. And I want to thank you very much again. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, we can do better than that. Let's have a real round of applause for Vane and for the Pops Orchestra. (laughs) 
I'd just like to point out that Vane and his wife, Sue, have agreed to, after the ceremony to meet anyone that would like to talk with them in more detail. They'll be in front of the stage, and I would welcome you to come forward and introduce yourselves. Detail. Sent her heart. Detail, halt, sent her face. Would you move the platform into position, please? Our flag deserves special respect at all times during its lifetime. And when it is in such condition that it is no longer a fitting emblem for display, it should be destroyed in a dignified way. There is no specified ceremony to properly retire the flag. But the flag code suggests that once a flag has served its useful purpose, it should be destroyed, preferably by burning. This action should be done discreetly so that the act of destruction is not perceived as a protest or a desecration and done in such a way to honor and respect the flag. The actual ceremony should be an event by itself with no interruptions or other business during the ceremony. It may be a separate part of a larger program as long as it has its own time from beginning to end. While not required by the flag code, reciting the Pledge of Allegiance is often done during a flag retirement ceremony. When this occurs, all persons present should stand at the position of attention, facing the flag with their right hand over their heart. When not in uniform, men should remove their headdress with their right hand and hold it at the left shoulder, the hand being over the heart. Persons in uniform should remain silent, face the flag, and render the military salute. What follows is a type of United States flag retirement ceremony being performed by the Honor Guard of American Legion Post 159 from Venice, Florida, commanded by Colonel retired Norm McClellan. Honor Guard, retire the colors. I am your flag. I was born on 14 June 1777. I am more than just a cloth shaped into colorful design. I am the silent sentinel of freedom for the greatest sovereign nation on earth. I am the inspiration for which American patriots have given their lives and fortunes. I'm in the emblem of America. I have led your sons and daughters in battle from Valley Forge to the sands and mountains of the Middle East. I have been through the birth of our country, the Civil War, two world wars, the Vietnam and the Gulf War, Iraq and Afghanistan, and the countless other operations in support of the oppressed. Never did I ask to permanently stay in foreign lands, only long enough to encourage freedom and democracy. When the time comes that I become old, tattered, or faded, do not let me fly in disrepair. Rather, retire me with dignity from my duties and me replace me with a new flag so that I may continue to symbolize our country. With this, I ask you to renew your commitment for what I stand and pledge your allegiance to me one final time. Ladies and gentlemen, Please stand and join the young Marines of Venice Middle School and the Girl Scouts of Gulf Coast, Florida in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, 
with liberty and justice for all. Honor Guard, order, harms. Honor Guard, post. Detail, post. This concludes the flag retirement ceremony. Should you have a flag which is no longer serviceable, you may take it to any organization that have formal flag retirement programs. These organizations include the American Legion, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, the Disabled Army Veterans, the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts of America, as others. You may be seated. The retreat ceremony serves two, a twofold purpose. It single, signals the day, the end of the official duty day, and serves as a ceremony for paying respect to the flag. The retreat ceremony may take place in a unit area, on the mili in, military installation parade ground, or in the vicinity of a flagstaff, where the units participating may be formed in line or massed. When persons not assigned to a formation are outdoors and in uniform, on the first note of retreat, they should stop what they are doing and face the flag if visible, or music if not, and assume the position of parade rest. Retreat lasts 29 seconds and is normally sounded by a single bugle to signal the end of the official day. After a short pause, at which time a cannon may be fired, to the color is played, again by a single bugle to render honors to the nation. It is important to note that playing to the color commands that the flag be rendered all the same courtesies as those given it during the national anthem. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise and render proper courtesies to our nation's colors during the plane of retreat. Bugler, sound retreat.
Order. Harms. At ease. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, our presentation this evening has come to an end. I hope you found it entertaining, enjoyable, and educational. In closing, let me thank the Patterson Town Foundation for gifting this magnificent facility to the Sarasota National Cemetery in honor of all members of our uniformed services and their families, past, present, and yet to serve. To Ms. Robin Fernandez for her beautiful rendition of the national anthem, to Vane Scott III for his inspiring performance of the many faces of old glory, to my co-hosts, Dr. Robin Bell and the Pops Orchestra of Bradenton and Sarasota, to the members of the Sons of the American Revolution, American Legion Post 159, Girl Scout Troops 78, 413, and 586, Veterans U, and the Young Marines of Venice Middle School, to Goodwill, Minnesota for its support and help during a flag collection campaign conducted just prior to tonight's event, to the Community Foundation of Sarasota County, to Sarasota Military Academy, who so graciously shared with us the blue cushions that you're sitting on, and we would appreciate it if you would leave them in place when you depart so that we can give them back to the Academy. To all members of my planning committee and the cemetery staff for their many hours of hard work to make tonight's performance possible. To all of our sponsors and volunteers for their support and willingness to help make this evening a reality. And thank you for joining us at Patriot Plaza at the National Cemetery of Sarasota for tonight's celebration of the Stars and Stripes. If you enjoy tonight's performance and would like to see more events of this type in the future, I ask that you visit our website at www.starsandstripescelebration.com to learn more about how you can help make that happen. In closing, I would like to salute my fellow veterans and all those who are currently serving in uniform, as is my son, and their families for your loyalty and selfless service to our nation. God bless the USA. Thank you and good night.